All right, well, I guess it's the top of the hour, so I guess we'll get started. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody to the Cybersecurity and Information Systems Information Analysis Center, or CISIAC, web webinar titled Architecture Practices for Agile at Scale, Strategically Managing Technical Debt to Improve System Quality. Uh, my name is Tom McGibbon from the CISIAC. Our presenter today is Rod Nord, who I will introduce in a few minutes. Uh, however, before we begin, uh, a few administrative comments. Uh, all phones have been muted except for the presenters today. Um, however, questions can be asked at any time during the presentation by entering them through the Q&A or the chat pane in your WebEx control panel. I will be monitoring uh, these panes uh, throughout the uh, presentation on behalf of Rod, and uh, as time permits, we will ask as many questions as possible uh, at the end of the presentation. Uh, one of the most, well, there's actually two very common questions. One is related to receiving copies of the slides. Uh, and yes, the copies of the slides will be available afterwards. Uh, if you would like a copy, please send me an, an email request. You can see my email address um, on the screen there. Also, people ask about whether or not uh, there's going to be a video available. Or, and yes, we will be we are actually recording uh, this webinar, and it will be posted probably within a day or so, and we will distribute a link uh, once it is posted. Uh, now to begin today's presentation, let me give just a, a brief overview about uh, the CISIAC. Uh, certainly note my email address for any follow-up, but the CISIAC is a specialized technical focal point and information clearinghouse for information assurance, cybersecurity, software engineering, modeling and simulation, and knowledge management uh, for our sponsor, who is DTIC. Uh, the CISIAC is operated by Quantarian Solutions Incorporated, who I work for and is funded through the Department of Defense's uh, Defense Technical Information Center, or DTIC. So funding for today's free webinar is provided in part by DTIC. Uh, please make sure to check out our website um, and join our community of practice at www.thecisiac.com. Now, something new we are introducing with today's webinar is to tr transition after the webinar is over, the conversation of today's topic to the CISIAC uh, Spruce website. Uh, basically, these webinars tend to end somewhat abruptly after an hour, leaving many of you wanting more information or wanting a place to ask further questions. So we're going to be using uh, some of the community building and social networking capabilities that we have put in place in our website to continue to engage today's pre presenter for continued collaboration. I will discuss more about that later in the presentation, however. But now um, I'd like to introduce our presenter. Um, Robert L. Nord, or Rod, is a senior member of the technical staff at the Carnegie Mellon Software Engineering Institute. He is engaged in activities focusing on agile architecting, architectural technical debt, and effective methods and practices for software architecture. He is co-author of the practitioner-oriented books, Applied Software Architecture and Documenting Software Architectures, Views and Beyond, and, and Lectures on Architecture-Centric Approaches. Uh, Rod earned his PhD in computer science from Carnegie Mellon University. So now I'll turn this presentation over to Rod. So Rod, please proceed. Okay, thank you, Tom, for the introduction. So this presentation is based on work uh, conducted in the Architecture Practices Initiative at the SCI and funded by the U.S. government, and as Tom mentioned, is available uh, for, for, to the public for release. So there's been a lot of interest in Agile, and people are asking, you know, why Agile? So Agile practices have been in uh, use for well over a decade now, with the net result that development teams are getting better at building software. So some of these reasons include visibility into a project and the emerging product, the ability of customers and end users to interact early with executable code, and the direct engagement of the customer in the project to provide a greater sense of shared responsibility with the development team. So all these factors contribute to delivering observable benefits to the end user early and offer often through the working software. So you might be asking, well, maybe you're you know, contemplating adopting Agile and asking, you know, how would this work for me and would I get the same you know, benefits that others are getting? Or perhaps you're already using Agile and, and thinking about uh, how can I improve? 
And you might be wondering, you know, given the Sisiak uh, community, you know, how does Agile scale, especially when you want to apply it to large enterprise systems or software intensive systems in regulatory environments, you know, whether in the government or in the commercial uh, sector. So these types of systems, you know, certainly the large scale systems span years and require longer term planning at the portfolio level. You know, Agile is initially conceived, um, you know, provided project management support at the team level with shorter term iterations or, or sprints. So now that Agile has been around for 10 years, we're starting to see, you know, more emphasis on release planning, you know, both on the research side and in, uh, you know, techniques and, and tools in the commercial space to help you know, manage these uh, different tensions uh, with shorter term iterations and you know, longer term uh, portfolio uh, planning. So this uh, gives the, you know, the team some you know, guidance in how do you make informed decisions about short term and long term trade-offs. And you know, we see organizations approaching this problem from these two perspectives. So a lot of them you know, certainly from you know, regulatory environments have more of a tradition of a waterfall-like approach in a regulatory environment, and they're working to reduce the footprint of these traditional software offerings by, by introducing agile or, or lean types of uh, concepts. But we're also seeing a lot that have already introduced an agile approach, you know, perhaps first carefully scoping that initial project to ensure early success, and now they're looking to scale and improve on their practice. So no matter what perspective you're coming from, I think that in the desire, the common desire, is to be able to move to providing more continuous you know, delivery, getting that you know, feedback and you know, delivering those new capabilities or improve uh, um, capabilities quickly. So at the Software Engineering Institute, uh, my perspective is from the architecture side. And you know, we see, see in practice now that these agile practices can be strengthened through the application of architecture analyses and, and release planning. So uh, you know, we see it as informed anticipation with just enough architecting in the context of agile release planning can provide some of these tools to de you know, balance agility, innovation speed on the one hand, but then also the system government governance uh, flexibility and planning for future needs on the other hand. So what are the risks? So maybe you're thinking about moving uh, you know, forward. Uh, certainly you want to uh, um, think about what are the risks. Uh, you know, we've conducted a number of empirical studies to observe best practices. And even among the most experienced you know, teams, you know, we see some of these common types of risks that you might be able to relate to. So um, you know, adopting Agile, you might get some initial uh, um, spurt of productivity. But then after a certain amount of time, you know, we see common uh, patterns where, you know, teams, you know, start to spend, you know, a little bit more and then more and more time fixing in defects. And then the new capability development needs to get deferred or starts to slip. Um, you know, Agile helps with the development team, but then when you start um, moving toward the integration, you know, products and scaling uh, different teams, you know, these bring in integration issues and incompatibilities may cause conditions that lead to uh, significant rework that wasn't anticipated. And then um, finally, progress toward meeting milestones may be unsatisfactory because of these unexpected rework uh, delays and causing overruns and uh, project completion delays. So there are a number of uh, technical best practices for Agile at scale, and, and Tom mentioned, mentioned the Sysiac Spruce community. So there's an article right now now on, on these technical practices that you can access at the URL at the bottom of this slide. So technical debt provides a strategic approach to managing system development in which the other practices can be understood and applied. So I thought I would use technical debt as the structure for organizing these uh, presentations and then you know, bring in some of these other, other uh, practices and then give you some pointers on where to go for more information. So first, I'll start off with giving you a little bit of background on managing technical debt to improve system quality. And then I'll talk a little bit about more of these systems of uh, concepts of scale that are important to realize in adopting Agile for these types of uh, software intensive systems. And then describe a little bit of, about this root cause analysis that's necessary to give you an understanding of you know, where you are in terms of the state of your development 
and uh, technical debt and uh, how you might want to uh, get there by using some architectural uh, tactics to uh, put you into a, a better state of being able to not only um, you know, deliver, but make that sustainable over the longer term. And then I'll talk about some you know, typical problems. So how do we use that root cause analysis and these tactics to, to uh, tackle some typical problems? And then end by talking a little bit about what we can do today. So you know, regardless of the context, you know, most widely adopted agile software development technique you know, today is, is Scrum. So we see Scrum you know, being used. It's a project management framework that provides techniques for increasing visibility of the state of the project. So one way that Scrum provides visibility that you can see here is in terms of charting velocity from sprint to sprint. So um, on the y-axis, you can see some indication of the amount of you know, stories or you know, features or requirements that are being uh, completed. You know, on the x-axis, you can see you know, um, how, how that's being uh, completed from iteration to iteration. So if we you know, think about this problem in terms of the extremes, if we focus entirely on priority and new types of features or stories, we can see initially that um, you know, velocity may be uh, great, but then if the underlying infrastructure isn't attended to, then over time, um, you know, more and more time is attended to these defects or infrastructure, and then the velocity may uh, um, um, decrease or even come to a halt when uh, a major refactoring uh, effort might be needed. But then. You know, the, the, the answer isn't, go, isn't to go to the other extreme and, and focus exclusively on cost and trying to eliminate rework, because if you do that, then more or less you're kind of you know, deferring when you can get out these requirements in the hopes that you know, someday you'll be able to put that infrastructure in place and um, quickly deliver. But then there's, there's a cost associated with this delay and also in delaying, you're not getting the necessary feedback. And then so perhaps you're not uh, really understanding the requirements and getting the feedback that you need early on. So the reality is that these decisions and trade-offs are being made continuously. So the goal is ideally we'd like to focus on using you know, metrics to monitor and focus the development effort. So in any given you know, point in time, whether it's in weekly sprints or more longer term you know, release plans, we'd like to uh, you know, understand these trade-offs between priority and, and, and cost and provide a, a notion of integrated uh, value and then be able to monitor this and make adjustments along the way as they're needed. So this brings us to the concept of, of technical debt. So technical debt is relevant to the use of Agile projects where the emphasis is on getting features out quickly, which might create a context for rework later. So at scale, you know, there's multiple opportunities for, sh for shortcuts, and understanding technical debt and its implications becomes a means for strategically managing the development of the system. So it's not all or, or nothing. It, it's not necessarily that all technical debt is bad. There might be reasons for making these um, you know, decisions, um, the important point is to understand that you're making them and, and technical that provides a way of thinking about this both from the technical perspective and then having a conversation you know, with the business to making you know, decisions that make um, sense at the time, but also understanding the long-term consequences so that they can be tracked and, and managed. So technical debt has been around uh, for a long time. It was first coined by Ward Cunningham at uh, Uppsala in, in 92, um, and then you know, more recently uh, Steve McConnell and some of the others have started to elaborate on the practice. You know, we see uh, you know, more and more interest now um, in terms of um, empirical research, and a number of larger organizations now are starting to look into technical debt management practices. So in order to understand the technical debt analogy, it's important to understand uh, certain concepts. So, you know, when was the debt incurred? What is the interest rate? And when will the debt be paid back? So, 
we've been collaborating with uh, Philippe Crichton, and he has a number of uh, experiences from industry, and we ex extracted this simple example that's you know, based on that industry ex experience, and hopefully um, helps you understand those types of context concepts. So let's say your management comes to you and has uh, you know, a great idea for a new type of uh, product or, or, or system. They want to implement a new feature, and that feature here is represented in green as, as a visible uh, feature, and wants to know, you know how much effort it's going to, to cost. So you as an engineer or as an architect, um, you, know, you know, think about the problem, you know, come back um, and um, give them some design alternatives. So in the first case, you might you know, think about uh, how to implement the feature, but then also, you know, what are the things that are likely to change? So, so what are some you know, common uh, aspects or services that could support that feature? And you know how could you build in some uh, flexibility to in anticipate some of the likely changes? So then you come back to your manager, and you say it's going to cost you know 15 you know units, whatever um, that amount is in terms of thousands or, or millions of dollars, and um, you know, build in some architecture or infrastructure support for total cost of, of 20. So then your manager comes back and says, well, no, no, that's you know, too expensive. Um, and you know we, we want to totally focus on this feature. So uh, you know what can you do? Can you do a little bit better? So then you go back, you back and, and think about it and say, well, if I do a little bit, of, bit less than the um, architecting, I can reduce the cost there. But because that infrastructure isn't providing the support, the feature needs to do, do a little bit more. So the feature is going to cost just a little bit more. But overall, the cost is going to, uh, you know, be lower than than the optimal architecture um, Im implementation. So then you go back to the manager, and um, your manager says, "Yeah, well, well, now you're on the right track, but it's still a little bit um, expensive. Let me, you know, see what you can you can do. Just you know, focus totally on the feature." So then you think about it. You can, you know, come back and say, "Well, if we just do a, a brute force type of." Implementation. Forget the architecture and implement the application. It's going to cost 18. So with only one application, the brute force approach is the least expensive, and then you might go off and, and implement it. But of course, we know that this isn't the end of the story. So um, after that first, you know, feature is implemented, we know that additional, you know, applications and features are, are coming. So now that the first one is um, you know, second one, um, you know, comes in, perhaps um, providing you know multilingual support. So not only English, but supporting uh, French in this case. And of course, if you'd gone ahead and implemented the infrastructure, then implementing this new you know feature would be the the least cost. So for an additional five units and uh, cost of of 25. If you had done something, you know, in between, that would cost a little bit more, but that would still be in the mid-range. But now that you've used the brute force method, uh, that's the most expensive, uh, you know, twice as much, 10 versus 5. And, and now instead of the brute force being the lo low cost, um, the, the, um, it, it now uh, becomes the, the higher, higher cost um, because of the decision that was, was made. But then you might be thinking, well, if it's going to cost me like 10 in the brute force for French, but then if it's going to, I could split that 10 into five in developing that architecture uh, A in the first column and then five for the application, uh, you know, couldn't I do that in, in a sense, kind of, you know, do a little bit of refactoring and, and reap that gain? But that's not you know, the, the whole story because the, the fact is that because you did brute force uh, for the first feature, there's still some, um, you know, refactoring that has to be done in the application, and so now the total cost uh, is is raised, and it's not just you know 10, but an additional two for for a total of 30. So this helps introduce you know some of these the concepts. Um, you know, when is it in, in introduced? Uh, you know, technical debt was introduced at the beginning. Uh, when that first you know feature and decisions were were being made, you know maybe it made sense. Now with the addition of the um, additional uh, feature, 
then the decision has to be made of uh, how, how to proceed. So perhaps um, um, you know, decision um, is made that um, you know to go ahead and kind of keep that debt um, and uh, continue to pay you know, interest because there's an additional cost of you know having that brute force and understanding you know the system as it is. Another alternative, you know, might be to repay the debt. So, so in this case, adding ar uh, architecture element A and refactoring the English element, um, you might be, you know, paying, you know, s some a little bit of interest. You know, maybe there's some debt conversion that could um, go on. So maybe you might decide to add architecture element B and then wrap the English element so you don't have to you know, refactor it. So you have a little bit of flexibility. So in a sense, you're paying down a little bit of the debt, but perhaps at the expense of some trade-offs in performance since you're wrapping that type of component. So the issue is that it's not just you know, all one or another, but by given these uh, you know, understanding of the concepts, you can start to think about you know, having that discussion. You know, what are the technical alternative designs and what are some of the paid back strategies that you might start to engage with at the business level. So these ty you know, types of interests that we talked about become you know, visible um, in terms of these project management uh, you know, tracking uh, metrics such as velocity that we talked about al already. So in this case now, you know, I, I've shown this diagram in terms of the velocity, and now we can understand it in terms of the framework of, of, of technical debt. Whereas, you know, initially you were getting, um, you know, high velocity, but perhaps at, you know, at the cost of incurring uh, technical debt and having to pay back the uh, interest. So these accumulating suboptimal architecture decisions over, impacts the overall uh, capability to reach the field in a, in a timely ma manner. And then the other extreme that we had shown was um, you know, doing things more upfront. So upfront requirements, a design task allocated first. But we see also that there's a cost associated with that with uh, delayed customer delivery. So the overall vision then becomes, you know, given uh, these new types of features or applications, we want to manage this tension you know, between delivering uh, capabilities first, um, and we know that that ex you know, extreme ignoring infrastructure doesn't work because we underestimate the architecting costs, um, but the alternative of moving toward infrastructure, and then capabilities neglect neglects the cost of, of delay to market. So we want to be able to, at any given point in time, you know, monitor and gain insight into those decisions so that we can improve our life cycle efficiency, you know, deliver capabilities uh, faster, as well as uh, sustaining over the longer term. Okay, so, all right, very good. Uh, so at this point, we'd like to get a little bit of input from, from you all out there. Uh, so uh, I, if I could ask John, who's our polling coordinator, to post, uh, no, that's the wrong question set, John. You want poll two? Okay, well, if there's a bit of a technical difficulty here, apparently, because um, we're interested in knowing uh, which areas that you observe technical debt the most, uh, whether it be for code, um, uh, architecture, um, there we go. So on code is uh, meaning perhaps our code has become very hard to maintain due to clones, cycles, bug fixes, and so on. Um, uh, could be architecture. We have made suboptimal architectural decisions that we need to re-architect soon. Uh, process, uh, we have skipped necessary practices such as reviews, testing, and documentation that we're now paying for, or all of the above, or none of the above. Okay, we'll keep this poll up for a few minutes, and uh, um, so we, why don't you proceed, Ron? Okay, so let's proceed, and well, when we get the results, we can, we can uh, comment on them. So given that you have uh, you know, an understanding of, of technical debt, there's three strategies to pay it back. So you could do nothing. You know, maybe if the product or, or system is at near the end of its uh, lifespan or 
it's an area that's not going to be uh, touched for you know, regulatory reasons. Maybe, you know, maybe it makes sense to do nothing, but if it's an active you know, area where it's being worked on, then the debt is likely to, to grow. Um, you could replace it. Uh, this typically uh, incurs high cost and risk. It may be appropriate if you've gotten so out of sync, um, but ideally if we're um, monitoring and tracking over time, we can start to think about paying uh, that debt back uh, in terms of incremental refactoring and committing to uh, investing in, in infrastructure a little bit over time. So when we start to think about uh, creating that payback strategy, it's, I think it's helpful to understand these two types of, of goals. So projects you know, certainly want to produce a, a, a product or, or system uh, you know, design and you know, implement that. But they also want to, uh, you know, plan for a desired software development state that enables the team to quickly deliver releases. You know, not only that first release, but um, sustain that uh, release you know, tempo over time. So I think when, you know, very early um, in, in Agile, I think they were, uh, you know, savvy in, you know, focusing and scoping the problem that Agile could you know, tackle in terms of the, the development uh, team and uh, get early uh, success. And often the, in the case was that this, you know, desired state um, often existed, so they were near this point, in, you know, arrow labeled uh, A, so that it either was a small enough, uh, you know, project or a single, you know, team. Maybe they've had experience in the domain or in the, um, in the technology so that the infrastructure was there or was, in, you know, implicit perhaps, uh, you know, architecture is, is, a, is a metaphor. But then, you know, over time as they'd like to start to uh, scale, then, um, you know, maybe you're starting off um, in your current state, you know, diverges, uh, in, is far from the uh, desired state. So I think these issues of scale that we'll talk about introduces new ch challenges that could place the team you know, further away from the desired state. It requires some amount of uh, preparation. It doesn't need to be you know, all up, up front, but I think there's a, a recognition that there's some uh, ramp, ramp up time. And even when you're in the desired you know, state and you're you know, maybe uh, can focus you know, more on, on uh, features and application de delivery, it's still important to you know, monitor that development state and pay attention to the infrastructure. So you don't want to either you know, uh, under-optimize or, or over-optimize, but you know, ideally you know, preserve that, that state as you go along. So I mentioned that you know, scale uh, introduces new, um, kind of you know, intensifies this gap you know, between the current and the desired state. So let's t just take a look at that at, um, for a moment. So we can think about scale in terms of three uh, perspectives, so scope, a team, and time. So the scope of the project um, you know, relates to you know, the domain that we're working in, uh, technology that's being uh, used, you know, what, what type of requirements, um, are, are these you know, new, new requirements or, or uh, requirements that are um, maybe can't totally be known up, up front. And now we're placing the, the scope in, in terms of not just the development team, but the, the entire um, you know, life cycle. So it could include some you know, downstream types of activities like you know, integration and, and testing. And is there a need to align you know, systems engineering with these software development activities as, as well? The second aspect of scale is team. So now we're moving from a you know, single development team where multiple teams need to interact. And so, you know, these could be internal or external to the organization. So now the dependencies uh, between the work products and the teams become, you know, more important. And um, understanding the end-to-end, -end, you know, delivery of features might, you know, require resources from multiple teams, you know, all the way um, from, you know, systems engineering, requirements, uh, you know, development, uh, testing, integration. And then the third aspect of scale has to do with time. So, you know, does the re work require different uh, release constra um, constraints for, for releases? So 
So not only do we have to you know, think about the developer uh, tempo, but uh, maybe there's a system integration lab that's operating at a different tempo. Maybe the customer is operating at a different uh, tempo in, in terms of uh, what they can you know, handle in terms of, of releases. Uh, you know, how long is the work uh, product expected to be in service? You know, we're talking about uh, you know, tens and tens of uh, years. And then how important are, you know, is sustainability in, in evolution? So that's a take a look at scale. You know, we've just um, uh, closed the poll already, and we see that there's um, kind of a, a kind of a expected you know, distribution. Um, you know, quite you know quite a few is expected in, in code. Twenty percent looking at architecture um, overall, as well as you know um, twenty percent um, all of the above. So certainly recognizing that there is. Your technical debt uh, you know, having a major impact um, from from different perspectives. Okay, so so scale gives us um, intensifies that gap. So then the, the next um, thing that I'd like to talk about is you so how do we understand you know what where where we are with respect to that gap? So what is the desired state and what is our, our current state? And in order to understand that. We've, um, we, you know, we have an, an assessment technique to understand, you know, agile development and architecture-related uh, root causes, you know, that might inhibit a project to deliver at an expected pace. So here we look at technical practices, but but also uh, practices that are central for those uh, practices to progress. So there, so so we need to take a look at the organization and process context, uh, product system goals. And vision, as well as the product and, and system uh, quality. So, as I said, you know, although our, our focus for this presentation is on the technical practices, you know, to understand the risks of those, we need to understand the project, you know, context. So, we have um, a, a couple examples here. Um, you know, response to change is a major, uh, you know, factor. So, it's important to uh, probe. Um, the project to understand um, um, what that environment is. Um, you know, is there a dynamic environment? You know, are changing requirements understood? Is it something that's uh, you know planned for rather than trying to you know nail them down all up front? Um, being able to you know, cope with uh, changing new types of uh, requirements, and then the same thing goes with changing uh, technologies uh, processes as well. And then we, we probe a little bit in terms of the culture. Uh, do people have the skills and knowledge, clear responsibilities, or is there a mentoring or training that can be put in place to help with that uh, probe in terms of the communication among the, the teams and management support? And then we also probe uh, on the technical side as well. So here uh, we have a couple examples um, from the architecture perspective. Are the architecture significant requirements, you know, things that we call the quality attributes, uh, understood? Are they defined, and are they actually used so that we can start to analyze to predict, you know, system properties earlier, and get feedback um, earlier about those requirements in the, in the spirit of agile? And then, um, is there a measurement environment in place to monitor the system quality uh, once we have those, you know, definitions? Of the quality attribute requirements, and can they contribute to the done criteria in, in addition to more traditional agile done criteria with respect to the features? And then there's also questions to ask about the architecture. So, is it um, uh, used? You know, does it help analyze those important requirements? Uh, you know, it's, it's not that all these things have to be, um, you know, decisions have to be made up front or at the same um, time. But we want to understand, you know, how those decisions are made, you know, which ones are are deferred, and how they're they're tracked and managed. So then, given that we um, have a better understanding of the gap, so we we kind of know our desired state, or we know where we are with respect to these, uh, you know, practices. What are some of the risks? So now let's turn to some architecture tactics. That can help us, you know, move and close that gap. So to um, kind of make our, our, our current state closer to our desired state. 
So I'll talk about uh, three types of tactics that, that, we, that we've seen. So the first one has to do with aligning feature and system decomposition. So there's many ways to uh, decompose a system and, and align responsibilities to teams or team members. So a common approach in Agile is more of this you know, middle um, approach that we see, this feature-driven approach where the Agile team has control over all the components necessary to implement a feature or a story. So this gives the team the ability to focus on something that has stakeholder value, and the team controls every piece of information um, in, in, in regarding the implementation for that feature. And they, they don't have to wait for someone outside the team to be finished um, to do their required work. So we call this uh, vertical decomposition because every component of the system required for realizing the feature is implemented only to the degree required by the team. But there's other um, perspectives. So there's the infrastructure-driven approach uh, that we see to the left here, where maybe it you know, makes sense to think of the system from the aspect of, of services. Um, and we call this horizontal decomposition. So a team member with uh, horizontally aligned responsibilities doesn't provide you know, direct value to the end user, but they are you know, taking a look at common, uh, you know, features that could be supported and make, you know, implementation, you know, more and more efficient or, or, or cost effective or, or, or flexible or sustainable over the longer term. And so, in, in reality, you might um, adopt a hybrid type of, of approach where um, you want to get features, you know, early to the users but also do some work uh, on these services and you know, horizontal layers. And this can be you know, dynamic as well. So to, you know, if you're far away from your desired state, then maybe you need to place a little bit more emphasis on the horizontal decomposition, you know, put some of that infrastructure in place, but at the same time you know, paying attention to a little bit of features but then over time, as you get closer to your desired state, then you could start to shift and um, spend more time on features you know, with a little bit of attention to the, the infrastructure. In order to do that, we need to think about and understand dependencies. So these dependencies could be you know, between the stories or, or features in the architecture elements. So this will help us, uh, you know, stage implementation of infrastructure in support of achieving stakeholder values. And then in order to do that, we also need to think about the dependencies among the elements because, um, you know, kind of a direct, um, you know, service um, to support a feature, you know, often depends on other, other, other things and they have to be taken into account. And the same thing regarding dependencies on stories. So maybe there's a high value story, but it may be require the implementation of a lower value story as a, as a precursor. And so um, that all goes into the, uh, the mix. And once we have this understanding of the dependencies, then we can start to think about you know, how do we organize the team and architecture to you know, uh, you know, decouple them so that they could work in parallel um, especially as the number of teams increases if we're working on systems of increasing scale. The second type of uh, tactic that I wanted to talk to you about is architectural runway. So the architectural runway has the goal of pr providing a degree, degree of architectural stability required to support the next and iterations of development. So this stability is particularly important to successful operation of multiple parallel teams and making architectural dependencies visible allows them to be managed and for teams to be aligned with them. So the runway supports team decoupling necessary to allow for independent decision making and the reduction of communication and coordination overhead. So this is something that was introduced by Dean Luffingwell and he explains the role of intentional architecture as one of the key factors to successfully scale Agile. So for smaller systems and teams, you may need a shorter runway, larger teams, longer runway is needed. So we've observed that you know, teams 
might um, you know, build runway uh, linking it in terms of their risk mitigation strategies. So they might you know, allocate a certain percentage of their time for building in unplanned infrastructure or forming you know, dynamic virtual teams to conduct spikes outside of sprints as needed to attend to the runway. And the third uh, practice that I'd like to talk to you about is the use of matrix teams in architecture. And this kind of you know, fits in uh, um, with the previous two uh, practices that I've uh, mentioned. So in its simplest instantiation, uh, Scrum development environment consists of a single co-located cross-functional team. But as we've discussed, as systems grow in size and complexity, the model um, needs to scale to meet developmental needs. So now we're talking about replication of team structure, responsibilities, or some hybrids of the vertical organizational team organization that can be supported uh, by the architecture, as, as we talked about um, with the horizontal and, and vertical types of alignment. So here's a picture where we see that the you know, teams are organized according primarily um, um, according to the layers. So, so this might be early on in a preparation type of setting where they're working on, on the layers. But it's important to get some early feedback and some features to the customer so that we see that members of the teams are working on features that pertain to that layer. So, and, um, and then in order to provide um, you know, communication across the teams, then a scrum of scrum consisting of those team members working on a certain feature can also um, you know, get together and um, you know, kind of talk about the um, system from the feature perspective. Uh, you know, later on, is, we'll, we'll, I'll show you some other examples where we flip this around. You know, teams will be organized according to features, and then perhaps like one person will be allocated you know, more toward the um, uh, infrastructure, and then they could get together from time to time you know, once most of the infrastructure is in place so that um, you know, less work uh, can be devoted to infrastructure and more emphasis placed on the features. Okay, so we've, we've covered a lot. I've introduced the concepts. So what, what I'd like to do to um, you know, bring this all together is return to those risks. So uh, um, let me talk about you know, two of those risks that I mentioned earlier and talk to you about how do we use the root cause analysis in some of these uh, tactics. So these are extracted from real life you know, systems uh, with uh, you know, industry folks that we've been either working with or doing uh, empirical studies. So one, one was this risk of scrum teams spending almost all their time fixing defects and new feature development is continuously slipping. So we found in this particular project that their initial focus was really too general rather than product specific. You know, you know it was good to anticipate a change, but without getting enough you know, experience with some particular you know, applications, then it just becomes um, you know, too, too big of a, a problem to try to, to manage. And then, of course, you know, time pressure to deliver becomes a top priority, and they start making some expedient uh, you know, choices and deliver an immature product. And then this just plethora of you know, hundreds or thousands of variation uh, parameters and how they inter you know, act uh, exponentially just becomes you know, too much to, to manage. And then to top that all off, you know, they had these different uh, release you know, cycles. So, so the development was trying to release you know, mon monthly, and then they would have a variant there. But then the testing you know, um, was on a different cycle, so then they would have to uh, test more variants. And then when you know, the customer could only handle things annually, and by that, that time there were just you know, too many variants to, to, ma to manage. So our suggestion in this case was to you know, stabilize the architecture. So, so go back, you know, organize the team as we had discussed horizontally, uh, you know, put in, put in um, a kind of a basic ar architecture, uh, you know, reduce the number of variant uh, parameterizations, you know, get some experience, and then start to think about you know, generalizing over time, uh, po postpone adding a lot of new features, and then you know, think about these release cycles between the development team testing and the, and the customer 
and, and revisit those uh, strategies against, against the variants. Uh, the second risk that I talked about was the integration issue. So integration of products, you know, built by the different scrum teams reveals that incompatibility defects cause many failure conditions and leads to significant out-of-cycle rework. So in this case, you know, again, this was a, a real team that we looked at. Cross-team communication was poor, even though there were many coordination uh, points. And different teams had different interpretations of the interfaces. Product owner didn't see the big picture, and, and a mismatch existed between the architecture and development. So again, from a technical perspective, we uh, advised to start to stabilize the infrastructure and the architecture to remove the uh, failure. You know, in this case, since they were pretty much um, along, you know, you know, we kept the they kept the organization where the teams were organized according to fe features. So you can see in the diagram where a Scrum team. You know, A uh, has, a, is, uh, has a, uh, responsibility for a certain feature set, a Scrum Team B uh, for another a feature set. But in this case, um, by more embracing the concept of an architecture runway, they would you know, stand up a, a kind of a dynamic temporary sprint team that would address um, some of these cross-cutting issues across the architecture. So this could help incorporate some of the anticipated requirements for the upcoming uh, releases without excessive refactoring on, on the part of the, the feature team um, at the time when they were trying to implement the you know, features. So I think it's important to emphasize the runway is, is just as important as these requirement epics. So they have a, a value, even though it's not always visible, that can help drive the company's vision uh, forward. So some of these tactics might be put in place when there's a larger gap, uh, when there's a smaller you know, gap where you're pretty much in your desired you know, state. You know, we're seeing increasing um, you know, sophistication in terms of uh, techniques and, and tools to start to provide some project management and product quality uh, um, indicators. So certainly things like defects and, and, and velocity um, are, are supported. And now we're starting to see um, some ideas of te technical debt in terms of the cost of you know, rework associated with architecture decisions starting to be come into play. So now you can start to um, you know, understand that information, compare it with the value of taking on the debt or not, and, and when to pay it back. And in terms of the tools, uh, you know, most of the tools you know, started out with more code-based types of analysis. We're starting to see some structural types of analysis in, in, in addition to code where there's more you know, module views and some um, you know, metrics that might be helpful in terms of coupling and cohesion, the size of modules, and, and whatever, and, 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 and so on. But, but some of these you know, measures uh, are hard to uh, get the big picture, so we think that using you know, um, other qualitative types of measures like architecture evaluations can, in, that produce risks then can help you know, guide these quantitative uh, metrics that the tools support. So they give you, you know, more of a sense of where the hot spots are, where you can then you know, zoom in and apply these uh, code-based um, metrics. So we see some encouraging um, efforts in that area. So I, I gave you a lot of um, information. I, I think that there's it's, it's a, kind of an exciting time to be in this area. Um, you know, there's, there's certainly, you know, the metaphor has been around for a long time, but we see, and you know, a lot of the you know, concepts have been around, but we're seeing an increased attention in terms of uh, empirical research being done, um, increased you know, inten uh, attention from organizations and advancing the state of the practice in terms of sharing practices and uh, giving that feedback to the tool vendors who are trying to uh, provide support. So there's certain practices that uh, we can all do uh, now and be incorporated into the projects. Uh, one is to make the architecture features and technical debt you know, visible. Certainly, you know, features, defects are, are visible to the end customer. Often technical debt is you know, visible more to the engineering team but not outward. So by making it visible, perhaps putting it in the, in the backlog, um, and you know, giving it some, um, you know, 
recording some of the important you know properties in terms of when was that debt incurred um, and, and thinking about you know payback strategies. Uh, we can differentiate strategic structural technical debt from technical debt that just emerges from low code quality. So I think in the poll, in the poll, many of you mentioned uh, issues with our architecture, and this can give us more of a strategic view in which perhaps some of those low quality you know, issues can be uh, understood. Um, we, you know, we see people starting to integrate technical debt uh, into planning and standard operating procedures. So in, in planning cycles, um, um, you know, t you know, technical debt you know, could be reviewed and, and assessed, certainly during peer reviews and in retrospectives as well, in addition to you know, reviewing you know, features and done criteria, also taking a look at the, the quality measures as well. And it can also be associated with, with risk in mitigated in that manner. So just a couple of final thoughts before we conclude. Uh, you know, so, so no one technical uh, practice alone can take any project to success. So I mentioned that technical debt is a strategic approach to manage system development in which the other practices can be understood and applied. So I mentioned some of those other practices such as coordinating multiple teams, using an architectural runway to manage technical complexity, aligning feature-based development and system decomposition using architecture evaluations to ensure that your architecturally significant requirements are being addressed. And there, there's other uh, practices being used that, that are mentioned in that Spruce article on technical debt practices that I didn't have time to mention. You know, some of these include test-driven development, continuous integration, prototyping, just to name a few, and, and, that, and that are important. And uh, you can get information from that article. Also, there are acquisition practices necessary to complement the technical practices, and that might be a, a topic for another type of uh, webinar if there's inter interest there. Uh, systematic root cause analysis, we, we talked about that, and is, is, is essential for understanding the risks arising in large-scale software development and understanding that gap of where you are between your current and desired state and your accumulated uh, technical debt. Um, you know, these different aspects of scale that I talked about intensify that gap. But I think embracing principles of agile development and architecture provide you know, together uh, more improved visibility of project status and, and better tactics for managing risk and, and technical debt. So here's my contact information if you'd like to uh, get in touch with me or check out uh, information at our website. I'll be happy to answer questions, but first I'm going to turn things back over to Tom. Okay, well, thank you very much, Rod. A very, a very excellent presentation. Appreciate it. Um, before we get into questions, I um, wanted to do two things. First of all, we, uh, we would like to get some feedback on the, today's presentation. So if I could ask John to post the, uh, the feedback uh, polling. Um, now, uh, also, what I'm showing here in this slide is um, uh, the, the community of practice that we have set up. Uh, we've set up an actual uh, page for discussion uh, from today's webinar. Uh, so we'd like to utilize our community of practice to continue this dialogue. Um, one of the things we'll be doing is posting the questions that have been asked and, and, and uh, put on it uh, Rod's answer. Uh, it's also a place for you to post additional questions. Um, what we will do um, is uh, after we've set up these questions uh, within the community and uh, put the answers in, I will send an email to all the people that have registered for this course um, asking them, asking you all to participate in, in this, and uh, uh, you know, to to continue talking about this important matter of um, agile and technical debt. Um, so, uh, having that said, we'll we'll leave this up a minute. Uh, there's a couple web addresses there. Um, you know, on the one on the right is at the bottom. There's a thing called the related resources, and it, and there's a link there that uh, takes you to the the article that uh, Rod contributed to and that he uh, he referenced in his presentation as well. Um, so uh, let's see, at this point, let me uh, get the, uh, we had a couple of questions. Um, let's see, um, 
the first question, Rod, is, is security debt considered part of technical debt in this presentation? Um, yeah, that's a good question. That's, that's one of the areas that you know, we are uh, looking at, that you know, tr you know, traditionally uh, you know, technical debt um, you know, evolve more from um, quality issues and are centered more around you know, modifiability type of, of issues. But we're also starting you know, to um, expand that notion to think about other quality attributes. So um, you know, we could start to think about you know, making you know, trade-offs as you do with you know, um, um, you know, modifiability with performance or, or security. Or certainly if you're thinking about your security, uh, you know, um, you know, how do you, um, you know, think about changing security over time? So, so perhaps if those requirements are, are, are changing or a customer is giving, you know, feedback or, or new technologies, you, you need to th think about incorporating, you know, new types of requirements with relation to security, and certainly that would be considered uh, technical debt. I see. Okay. Um, could you go back to slide 31 for a minute, uh, Rod? Okay. Um, this one uh, attendee would like you to expand as much as possible on this because um, he says that a lot of EA decisions are long lead time and need to be made up front without mm -hmm. reverting to waterfall. Mm -hmm. Okay. So. Um, yeah, yeah. So this, this diagram, yeah, so kind of um, yeah, incorporates kind of notions of you know, all three practices, you know, that I talked about. So there's this you know, horizontal vertical alignment, and then there's the runway, and then, you know, using the, you know, the teams to, to organize. So in this diagram, you know, we see that there's the three scrum teams, A, A B, and C. So they're all, you know, organized, um, uh, you know, horizontally along the, the architecture. So I think it's the person asking the, the question, yeah, the extreme case, you know, might be that there is no, you know, feature development. And so that might be a, you know, more of a traditional, you know, waterfall type of you know, situation where you're trying to, you know, you know build all the architecture um, up front. Um, you know, the way that I was you know, casting um, the concepts is that uh, if, if, you know, depending on the, you know, the size of the, of the system, you know, how much, so it kind of depends on you know, how much of the runway you need to, uh, you know, build out. Uh, you know, how much are, are you? Is there a gap, you know, between your current and your desired state? Um, it may, you know, you know, there may be more of an emphasis on, on architecture. But I think, like, even if if, if that's the case, um, you know, there are some, you know, features that you might start you know, to think about to get some, you know, earlier, you know, feedback. So rather than having a strict, you know, waterfall, you know, starting to, uh, you know, build. Um, some you know early use cases or features that can give some important you know feedback. So that's what the orange you know the feature. So there's this like you know first feature that you know one member of each team is responsible for building and then you know getting together um, in a, in a scrum of scrums type of situation. So that you know perhaps you know, over time is, is a little bit more that infrastructure is built and you could you know shift shift that uh, dynamic. I see. Okay. Um, do you have any specific quantitative metrics to measure technical debt? Um, yeah, yeah. So there are some some you know metrics you know, supported by uh, uh, tools. There was also a good uh, article by Heiko Kozalek from ABB that um, kind of you know listed kind of the state of the art in. Kind of, you know, software architecture, you know, metrics. So, so I think some of the things that you know, the tools are are supporting are um, you know coupling or cohesion um, type of, of, of metrics. You know, one of the things that, that we've been looking at more closely is what's called propagation cost or alternately you know stability. So here, you know, there, there's the um, kind of you know metric that you know if you're going to make a change. You know, to the system, you want to be able to follow the you know dependencies and to see you know what else you know could ripple uh, through the the system. So that's one thing that's common, and we've been you know looking at that and how we might be able to you know improve that metric. 
to give um, you know better, better measurements. Okay. Okay. Um, so, what do you view are some of the best practices to define the architecture runway? Uh, some of the agile projects lack adequate upfront requirements analysis, and therefore make it hard to define the, the runway. Do you have any suggestions? Yeah, I'm thinking about um, kind of a, a pair of projects that yeah, we had looked at um, when we were doing our, our, our surveys. You know, these were very yeah, larger scale yeah, yeah, teams that were looking, using like hybrid, uh, agile, and architecture practices. And, and one um, you know, or, you know, organization you know, pretty much you know, failed. And this was the you know, situation like, yeah, where they were you know, doing some you know, prototyping and then it kind of an unexpected requirement, you know, came up. So they were kind of going along, you know, fine. And then the customer said they needed a, you know, larger you know, data set. And then this, um, you know, created um, you know, performance pro problems. And then they needed to, in a, you know, yeah, in a sense, you know, change, change the, um, you know, make some architecture, you know, changes. So by, you know, having a runway or not um, could be more or less helpful. So one, you know, team, um, had a real problem with that. Another, like, had some, um, you know, really kind of you know, took it in stride. And I, and I think that the, the team that was successful was looking at it from three, like, you know, uh, perspectives. You know, so one was a kind of a larger organizational uh, process perspective where they had, um, you know, certain integration, you know, points. So um, um, kind of in the earlier you know, slide, um, let me see if I can bring that up. Um, you know, they had something that looked, you know, a little bit like this, so that they had these integration, you know, points to get, you know, early integrate feedback, you know, from the customer, but also, um, you know, being able to, you know, integrate that, uh, you know, information and dynamically, you know, adjust as, as things changed. Then the second, you know, area, you know, was with the uh, attention to architecture. So some of the things that they were, um, you know, building into the architecture to make it a little bit more, uh, you know, f uh, flexible. So uh, you know, having these, you know, common, uh, you know, services, uh, kind of anticipating some of the types of changes. And then the third level was really at um, kind of, you know, providing some kind of coding guidelines so that as these types of changes came came up, you know, they had a facility to. Um, you know, try them out, you know, off of the main line so that the main line, you know, wouldn't get disrupted in terms of delivering, but then they could, you know, very rapidly, you know, prototype, you know, get some in, um, information and then kind of, you know, bring that back in, into the main line. So it was those you know, combinations of things, I think, that gave them some you know, flexibility when, um, you know, something unexpected came up to, to address it and then kind of expand the runway, uh, you know, longer or, or shorter as needed. Okay, well, I, I think we better uh, cut it off there. We did have a couple other questions, but we will take those uh, to our uh, website and, and post them there as well. Um, but, Rod, I would like to thank you very much for uh, this excellent presentation. It's clear there's a lot of interest in this topic, and so we appreciate your, your expertise in, in this area. Um, and so 